Good morning, Sea Light Church. So I have this water here, and so if I don't spill it on stage, we win this morning. I have it because I've been losing my voice for the last week, and so I might sound like a maturing young boy at some point <laughs> this morning. Uh, good morning, Sea Light. My name is Mo. I am one of the pastors here. Um, it's exciting. We've been walking through the book of Ruth for the last three weeks, and this is week four. Uh, if you don't know much about the book of Ruth, uh, there are four chapters. So it's a four-part series, and we're in chapter four right now. Uh, so if you have a Bible, open it up to chapter four in the book of Ruth. And as we, as we journeyed along in this book, what we found to be true is that these, this story here is an unfolding story of really normal, ordinary people. They're very average. There's nothing super spectacular about them. We don't see the seas parted by them. We don't see miracles necessarily take place in their midst, but yet they're recorded in all of scripture for all of eternity for us to, to glean wisdom, to glean life understanding from. Um, and, 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 they, and as we journeyed with them, we've seen some really real things, right? Like we've seen pain uh, at the beginning of the story in chapter one and chapter two, we see God start to provide for that, right? Like there's a provision from God in that. And then in chapter three, last week, we saw God's um, God's providence, his sovereignty over the entire situation that these individuals are going through. Uh, and, and I think that's important for us to continue to understand is that God is in the inner workings of every single aspect of our life. He's not simply just uh, sitting pie on the sky on a chair waiting for us to die so that we can go to heaven. That's, that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve actually is interacting in our life on a daily basis. And so um, a friend of mine uh, that I was meeting with the other day, he was interacting through him in my own heart uh, a little bit. But we were having this conversation about life and, and marriage and, and all these just the things that you talk about when you get with a really good bro, right? Um, and, and so then the conversation conversation kind of took a turn, and he made this very profound statement, and it keeps lingering in my soul, actually. Like, it hasn't left yet, and I hope it doesn't ever, but here's what he said. He said, your kids won't forget the faith steps you take. Your kids won't forget the faith steps you take. Now, now that may not seem like this profound statement on the surface, but what my friend was alluding to, he's saying, hey, um, we have this faith that we have in our hearts, right? Like, we, we believe it, we teach it to, the, to people around us, we teach it to our kids, and we kind of pass it on that way. However, what he's saying, there's something actually probably more valuable than that, not that we don't teach, not that we don't believe those things, but that we'd also show that we believe those things, that we'd live a life that is marked by this faith that we, that we say we have, he says, your kids won't forget the faith steps that you take. And so when I was writing this, I was like, okay, so there's a term that, that has been used historically, the word legacy, right? And, and the hard thing for me in that is that like, people in my generation and the next one don't really use that word legacy, right? We, we, it's just not a, a term that we would necessarily come up with. And so I started reading like synonyms and stuff like that. I couldn't spell synonyms, so Google helped me out with that. Um, it, but, but I was trying to look for words that would like, carry the same kind of weight that that word did, and I couldn't find it. And so then I started calling like, people who were smarter than me, like my wife, and was like, hey, do you know a different term? And she's like, nah, man, I think that's the only term you can use for that. Uh, and so I was like, okay, fine. So here was my conclusion of that. The word legacy is one that we ought to adopt. If we don't currently use it, it's something that we ought to adopt. Legacy meaning the impact that you make that lasts beyond your own lifetime, right? Legacy meaning uh, the impact that you make that lasts beyond your lifetime. And here's my thoughts. I, th I think there's a couple reasons, a few reasons why we don't necessarily like or use that term. One, I think it's because it's intimidate, we're intimidated by the idea that our life actually matters and can have an impact beyond ourselves, right? Like that's a weighty thought, the fact that my life actually matters beyond me. I think the second one is, is that while our faith says that there's another life beyond this one and we believe that and stand in that, in all reality, our worldview, how we see the world actually doesn't match that. We believe this is it. Like, that's how we kind of live in, in such a way where, like, I have to hold on to what I have. I have to possess all that I can and, and try my best not to die, right? Like, that's kind of the, the, the seeking of pleasure, so hedonism on one end or just kind of schizophrenia of trying not to kill yourself in the process. Like, that's kind of how we treat life from a worldview that says that we won't live forever. And then the third one that I came up with is, is, is we aren't giving enough attention to our own mortality, 
We're not giving enough attention to our own mortality. I think it's Charles Spurgeon who says, a man who thinks of his death often is a maturing man. And essentially what he's getting at is saying, man, we have to often think about the fact that there's an eternity ahead, which means we have this this time within our dash, the the time we were born, the time that we die. We have this time that we can invest to have a great legacy, a great impact on the world beyond ourselves. And no matter what your relationship with is in in the terms of the word legacy or not, here's what I know to be true. Every single person wants their life to matter, right? We want to have purpose. We want our life to matter. And and I'm convinced that the only way that that's going to be true is if if we leave a legacy of faith that can only come through Christ. And so as we look at our story in the final chapter of Ruth, that's exactly what we're going to look at. We're going to see some very ordinary, normal people who leave a spiritual legacy beyond anything that they could ever have imagined. Look with me at verses 1 through 4, 5, sorry. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down, and, and he took, the, the, took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So that they sat down. They sat down a lot. My goodness. Uh, then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the p- parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it. Thank you so much. That's awesome. (laughs) If you redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, the guy, the redeemer, I will redeem it. So the first observation in this, other than the table being brought up magically, um, is that legacy is obedience invested. Legacy is obedience invested. So here's what happened. Chapter 4 begins, and our boy Boaz shows up. Uh, at the gate. And, and for us, that doesn't make any sense. But for them, showing up at the gate meant that he was going to the place where not only did a lot of people come in and out of, but generally speaking, that's where things went down. Like the elders were the people who came in. So if you had a conflict with a neighbor, if you had some sort of issue that you were trying to address in the community, you go to the gate where the elders were. So they kind of helped sort that out. They didn't necessarily go to courts to, to sue people. They just said, hey, elders, help us figure this out together. And then also, this is where business was conducted, especially if you need witnesses in, in, in business business affairs. And so that's why he came to this place. And as Boaz goes, he's hoping that the guy comes through, right? The guy that we were talking about, the redeemer, the one who actually has the the actual rights to redeem Ruth and Naomi, he's hoping the guy comes by and he does. And and as we saw in in, in, uh, last week, and when Andrew was preaching on this, uh, I think it's chapter three, verse 12, uh, Boaz reminded Ruth and said, hey, there's another guy out there. They never actually name him, which I'll talk about later, uh, out there that has the right to redeem you. So I'm going to go to him first. I'm going to obey God in his command to find the rightful redeemer first and get you redeemed. Now, here's the crazy thing about Boaz, because everything that that has led up to this point in the story depends on what this person decides, whether or not he decides to obey God or not obey God. And as we recall about Boaz, he's an honorable man who desires to marry Ruth. He wants to marry her, and yet he pushes aside his desires, obeys God's command by saying, I'm going to find the rightful redeemer first and see if he will obey God. So, so he not only does that, but then he also makes sure that they got provided for. He didn't have to do that. He could have said, hey, you should go find that guy. You go figure it out. But instead, he puts aside his own desires and wants and says, you know what? I'm going to follow God, but I'm also going to make sure people are taken care of. What an amazing man, right? So in our text, he gives the pitch. Now, the one person that I know that can sell water to a whale or ice to an Eskimo is Austin Edwards. Um, <laughs> And I feel like that's what Boaz did here. Like, he was fairly shrewd. He's like, hey, man, there's some land out there that's rightfully yours. You should buy it, right? Like, he pitches him with, like, the idea of something that he might be genuinely interested in. He's like, oh, wait a minute. That's a, that's a good idea. Like, to expand my property, get, have more wealth, have more to pass on to my kids later on. Like, why wouldn't you buy property, right? Like, it's a great investment. If you're not buying property, if someone told me you, you're, not, you're not really investing in anything. Anyway. But nonetheless, he just pitches it to him and says, hey, here, he tries to convince him to go ahead and take it. And so the guy says, yeah, I'm in. I'll take it. 
Now, if I'm Boaz, that's not how I pitch it, man. Like, I don't make you want it. I'm trying to tell you that you don't want it, so I get what I want. But instead, being an honorable man, he takes the step and says, no, you can have the land, but here's the catch. You have to marry Ruth the Moabite. Now, the, the, the unnamed man at this point, he backs out. He's like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Uh, <laughs> right? Like, he, he declines because for the unnamed man, obedience to the Lord's command wasn't working out in his favor. And so he decided not to obey. That's what is happening here. Right? Like, it wasn't obeying God's command didn't work out in his favor, so he decided not to obey. He no longer wanted to do what God would call him to do. So here's the question for us in the room. As we're putting ourselves in the story, is your walk with God simply marked by a transaction with God or a relationship with him? Is it marked by a transaction with him or a relationship with him? You see, Jesus could simply be a, a transaction by which we gained from, or we could actually have a relationship with him. So transaction. In the transaction between you and God, we win every single time. Just, just in case you didn't know that, like, we win. Like, we get a relationship with God. We get redeemed by God. We get to profit. And then what we want to do if we have a transactional relationship is basically live the way we want, right? Like, I'll take my get-out-of-hell-free card, and then I'll do my life the way I want to do my life. The issue with that is that kind of relationship with God, a transactional one, doesn't heal. Uh, it, because here's the thing. God doesn't want to just forgive your sins and give you all of eternity with himself. That's, that, that is a goal. He wants that, but that's not all that he wants to do. He wants to actually provide healing in the here and now, in the depths of your soul. And that doesn't get cleaned up if it's only a transactional relationship. I pray to prayer, therefore you give me heaven. Right? And then the other aspect that typically takes place within that is that in this relationship to God, we receive the truth of the gospel, but not necessarily the grace of it. And here's what I mean by that. We start to function still in workspace righteousness anyway, right? Try harder, do good, or be a good person. Because here's the thing. If I'm living my life my way, I'm going to try to be the best person I can to please God anyway, even though I know the truth of the gospel. So we continue to replicate that. Anybody resonate with that at all? Like a lot of times I have a transactional relationship with God. Is we played the game early on. I prayed a prayer. I bowed my knee. But now I'm kind of living my life day by day as I might see fit. And all of a sudden I do something that I know I shouldn't do or think something that I know I shouldn't think. And then all of a sudden I'm trying to do something better for it, Right? Like, that's the transactional relationship with God. Belief without a foundation, basically. Uh, Matthew 7, 20 through 24 through 27, here's what Jesus says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and, the, and it beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And anyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat against that house and it fell and great, and great was the fall of it. You see that? So, so hear me. Here's what Jesus just said. He said to hear the word of truth and not be a doer of that truth means that your house is built on sand. You see that? To hear it, to know it, but not do anything with it is essentially building a house on sand, right? Like, and the, the, here's the problem with that. Like, when the storm comes, because he's assuming the storm will come in your life, what's going to happen is your entire life gets rocked by the reality. Remember what I talked about in chapter one, where pain is normal, right? Like, you remember Ruth and Naomi, they all lost their husbands, and they were all lost and poor and had to go back to Israel where they might not be treated fairly. Like, pain is an inevitable process, right? You remember my story. Like, if I shared some of it, the fact that I grew up with a drug addict father and all these other things, but post-Christianity, like post-coming to know Jesus, I lose my grandmother, I lose my previous wife, and now I'm about to lose my mom as well. Like, life has pain. It's a reality, and if your house is on the sand, well, those kinds of realities get not only shaken, but all of a sudden you start to fall. You start to fall away from this God that you said that you've entrusted your life to. And see, here's the thing. that we, we all have these things. We all have these things that, man, if it were true, I might walk away from God. Right? Like, is it your spouse? Is it your mom? Your job? Your finances? Your comfort? This relationship you have, that relationship you have, whatever it might be, if you were to lose it, your, is your house going to fall? But what Jesus pleads with, us, pleads with us in this and says, no, have your house built on a rock. 
Have your house built on the rock, which is a belief so much so that we're willing to obey even when it hurts because we know that he's good, right? Like this relationship with God, it actually means obedience. If you have a real win with God, it means obedience. John 14, 22 through 24 says, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and, he, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Catch this, whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You see that? Jesus equated obedience with loving him. So to not love Jesus is to not obey Jesus. And so to come back to our story here full circle, Boaz is leaving a legacy by obeying God, but the unnamed man is less so, right? Like, he's, his life isn't going to be marked by obedience, but Boaz's is. That's the legacy that he gets to leave for uh, generations to come. And furthermore, is a legacy invested based on his obedience. Because here's what he did. Boaz trusted God even when it might hurt him. Right? So remember, back in the story, he loves Ruth. He wants to be with Ruth. That's his ideal scenario. And then he gets land, too. So, like, he gets money out of the deal. So it's like money and a pretty girl. Like, why not? Like, it's a win for this dude. And yet he said, no, I'm going to obey God first. And then, then Boaz, he, he trusts that God knows what's best, right? Like, this doesn't make sense. Why take them to a man who's not even interested? Why not give them, her to me? Because I'll love her and take care of her. It doesn't make sense. And yet, he trusted God. And Boaz invested in his legacy with an unwavering obedience for God's word. And that's our investment. To, to invest in a legacy is to invest in our, our obedience to God, right? Obeying God even when it hurts or doesn't make sense for us. Now, the unnamed man decided not to follow through with what God required in his word. Uh, and the reason why he rejected it, though, uh, is because it was far too costly. It was going to cost him too much. Look at verse 6. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the, the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to per perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from the, among the, his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. So the second observation that we see here when it comes to a legacy is a legacy is sacrificially invested. It's sacrificially invested. So this unnamed man, he counts the cost, right? He's looking at the scenario and saying, hey, this is not a win-win-win for me. I'm not going to do this. He crunches the number. He sees it as a business transaction. It's like, I'm looking at my bottom line here, and to invest in this kind of legacy is not the one for me. And it says it wasn't a good deal for him, right? Like, if you really read it and, and consider what he's doing here, when he looks at it, he's actually going to lose money on the deal, right? So, so let me give you the scenario. So he invests in the land, and then he gains a wife and a mother-in-law, which means he's got two more mouths to feed. So any money that he might be pouring into that land, instead, it's actually going to be going into feeding these two individuals and making sure they stay alive. And not only that, if Ruth has a baby, which, mind you, is the whole point of this whole thing, right? Like, the whole point is to continue the name of Elimelech's family on through her seed, right? And so if she got pregnant, which was the ideal scenario for the Redeemer, he was supposed to do that, well, then that son, the firstborn son there, would actually inherit that land once his mom died, once Ruth died. So the dude wouldn't even own the land that he invested in. So that means even the money that he put into it, he would have also lost. And all of a sudden, this other family altogether gets it, and his family gets less. So he counted the costs and said, man, I'm not willing to lose, right? Let's, let's pause for a second on that. So if we look at this scenario for this guy, it makes sense, right? 
Like we, we, we're told this all the time, make a smart, a wise investment, one that's going to pay dividends back to you in the here and now, right? Like, do you have a Roth IRA? If not, you probably should get one, apparently. Um, but like that, that, that's essentially what we're told. You make investments that are going to have a return. And when he said this investment, earthly speaking, materially, he's not going to have a gain on this. He's, it's, a, it's a net loss. And so here's the question we have to ask ourselves as we're looking at this man who's very practical and very normal. It makes sense when it comes to investing his finances, time, resources, and even his family to some extent. Are you following Jesus for the benefits package or because he's worthy? Are you following Jesus because of the benefits package or because he's worthy? You see, following Jesus has a great benefits package. I'm just going to be honest, right? Like, like your sins are forgiven, right? Any past, present, future sin that you ever commit, God says is redeemed in Christ himself. He was crucified, punished for that sin, so therefore you're not held accountable to it, right, in that form. Secondly, you get bought into a beautiful yet messy, wonderful community of God, right? Like loneliness is an epidemic in our world, is it not? With social media and all the things, like we have a connection to people, but we don't have intimacy with people. And so therefore, God provides this intimate family that you get to be a part of. It's a pretty good benefits package. And then here's another one. You don't get to go to hell. I mean, seriously, like if you, I say, hey, man, how many of y'all want to go to hell? Just raise your hand. Right? Like, nobody's going to do that unless you have some sort of delusion as to what that means. Like, you're not going to raise your hand for that. And then to top that off, you get all of eternity to rest in bliss with God himself. That's a great benefits package. Not bad, right? But here's the thing. To follow Jesus is costly. Now, I said that as a matter of fact statement, because here's the thing. If it's not costing you something, you probably don't have the relationship to follow him. That's, that's true. Now, here's what I'm not saying, just in case you're new in the room. I'm not saying that you have to do works in order to walk with Jesus. I'm not saying clean yourself up, finding Nemo syndrome. You remember that scene in, in, the, in the story, Finding Nemo? So they put this guy in the tank. I'm going to tell it anyway if you haven't seen the movie yet. Go ahead and watch it. Uh, Disney Plus. Uh, so they drop Nemo in, in this tank, right? They drop him in the tank with all these other fish. So Nemo is from the ocean. They drop an ocean fish in a tank fish, right, with all these other fish. And what they do is they scatter away from him. And then they come back in once the cleaning fish came and cleaned him all up and made him look like everybody else. That's not what Jesus does with you. What Jesus does with you, he meets you right where you are. He does clean you up, but he doesn't wait for you to clean yourself up to do so. So that's not what the message of the gospel is saying. That's not what I'm saying either. It is a free gift of grace that God would provide for us, right? But a life marked by Christ leaves a legacy that is costly. A life marked by Christ leaves a legacy that is costly. Uh, you remember the guy, Matthew 19, rich young ruler is what he's known for. Um, the story goes, essentially, the guy approaches Jesus. He's got good money, good wealth, and he's a very, very moral guy. He's a Midwestern Nebraskan, right? Uh, anyway, so he comes up to Jesus, and he's like, Jesus, how do I get eternal life? And I don't know about you. When I read that text, the thing that I'm pleading with Jesus for is just the softball pitch, right? Like, man, the guy wants to know Jesus, so why don't I just tell him, hey, pray this prayer right now, confess that you're a sinner, repent, turn toward Christ, receive Christ, and you'll be good. And then he goes and takes his money and runs along, right? Like, that, that's what we're hoping happens. But instead, what Jesus says is he starts out at the beginning and says, hey, obey God's command. So he gives about seven or so of, Jesus's, of, of God's ten commandments and says, hey, obey these perfectly. And the dude was like, man, since I was a kid, I did that. That's easy. I don't know how delusional this guy is. I've broken every single one of those and some. Like, I'm not sure how he's done that, but he, okay, let's just give him that piece. Say, okay, fine, you're this weird moral guy who's somehow obeyed all of God's Ten Commandments for his entire life. But, so at this point, you think, oh, great, now he's going to hand him the keys of the kingdom. No, Jesus says, okay, okay, bud, I get that you think that you're really great, but here's the thing, sell everything that you have and come follow me. It says in that story that that man walked away in tears because he had so many possessions, so many things that he held so tightly to that he wasn't willing to give them up for Christ. You see that? So to him, he was so willing to hold on to what was precious to him and not release them so that Christ might be precious to him. Does that make sense? So listen, if you're sitting here thinking, man, I'm a little nervous now. Because what might God be telling me to give up so that I might follow him, right? That might be what you're thinking, and I want to say good. You should be. You should be thinking that thought. 
In fact, that would be very human of you to think that thought. Uh, and, and as last I checked, we're all humans in the room, right? But it, it, like I said in the beginning of the series, we have a lot of prosperity, right? And so it's easy to kind of think through that. Like, I have a lot. And what might God might be calling me to give up? Like, is it a family member? Is it a relationship? What is that thing that I'm holding so tightly to? Because if we're honest, here's, here's, here's how we have to be really honest with each other. I think uh, Pastor Matt Chandler used to say this all the time before he got brain cancer, and now he says it even more. But we're all like one phone call away from our entire life being destroyed, right? Just one. And so ask yourself, what, what is that phone call? What's the phone call that says, man, I'm just going to be left devastated, and I don't know if I'll be, be able to walk with God anymore? I remember uh, when Colleen and I were called to plant uh, City Light Church. It was, it was going to be uh, four years ago here in March that, that we received that call. And um, it wasn't easy. <laughs> like, for most people in the room, you're like, wait a minute, you got like a 1,000 people that come to your church every single week. What do you mean it wasn't easy? Well, here's the thing. I worked a job that paid me a paycheck <laughs> um, on a steady basis before this was planted. I had a community that I was a part of. I, I had very little responsibility. Like, I had hair then. Not really. Um, <laughs> like, and I was still doing good work. I was doing ministry. People were hearing the gospel. And so, yes, yeah, this was scary. And, and so we decided to obey what God had called us into. And, 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 okay, so for some of us, when we think about it, we're like, well, yeah, you're a pastor. Of course you obey God and did what you're supposed to do. I'm also a human being, right? Like, I got mouths to feed. I got bills to pay. That's a steady paycheck. I don't know if people are going to show up, right? And I mean, even at the time, like, when, when the, the end date for my job was about three months before our first core team gathering in August. So I'm like, I don't even know where I'm going to get a paycheck. I don't know how my kids are going to eat. I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. I might lose my house kind of deal. It was scary, Right? And then, not only that, I was going to gain a ton of responsibility because I'm running around town telling people about this church that God is going to plant that's going to be amazing. It's going to reach people with the gospel. People are going to get baptized. People are going to get saved. And I don't know that that's true yet. Right? But God. But God provided so much more than I ever lost, right? Like, my wife and I will tell you readily, we have a much deeper, intimate relationship with God because we said yes to that. And it's not necessarily because of the church. It's because when you take those steps of faith, God comes, right? He comes. And, and not only that, we have this incredible community that we're part of. Like, I, I literally have best friends in my city group that will be my lifelong friends because I said yes to Jesus in that, right? And, and it's, it's still a lot of responsibility, right? Like, I'm still losing more hair somehow. Um, but, man, God's done some incredible things with that, right? Like, we've had over 180 baptisms and counting. Like, it's going to happen. There's going to be more. People in the community around this building are being engaged with the gospel. College students, by the hundreds, maybe even by the thousands, by the time you count them all coming through, have been impacted with the beautiful good news of Jesus Christ himself. And then four church plants in just four years. God has done immeasurably more than we could ask or think. At this moment, though, I need to say something because here's the thing. That might not have happened. Right? And so here's the truth. Even if none of that took place, Jesus is still worthy. Jesus is still worthy. He is worthy beyond anything we could ever imagine. Catch this. I can't out-sacrifice the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It's impossible. I can't out-sacrifice him. That's the gospel message, is it not? The fact that the God of the universe would take the, the most gracious sacrifice you could ever imagine. He sends his only son. I got three sons. I'm not sending any of them for you right? He sends his only begotten son, comes and lives a perfect life. And I mean perfect. Like this dude is not an adulterer. He is not a pedophile. He is not looking at pornography. He is, he is not lying to his mom and dad. He is not uh, cheating on his taxes. He's, he's not some religious leader trying to rule over people and trying to push them down. No, that is none of that. Jesus was perfect, perfectly loved, perfectly had peace, perfectly obeyed God. And yet he went to a cross and took the punishment you and I deserve. So he was fully obedient to the Father, even to the point of death on the cross, and sacrificed his entire life. Why? So that he might live, leave a faith legacy for you and I. That's what he did. 
we reap the benefit of his investment of himself. The sacrificial, obedient life of Jesus is for you and I. We get to have his legacy. You cannot out-sacrifice the sacrifice of Christ. So if you're asking yourself, is he worth the sacrifice? You have to really ask yourself the better question. Is there anyone else, including yourself, worthy of such sacrifice? See, Jesus left us this beautiful legacy of faith. Now, the story that we're looking at, it takes a turn and looks at Boaz a little bit more and his response to all of this. And so, because not only was he obedient, but he, he was willing to take that sacrifice, right? Like he, he willingly took the investment. Look with me at verse 11. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in F I, four weeks later, Ephrathath, there we go, uh, and, he, and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. I'm going to keep reading because I think it's important. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in all of Israel. He shall be you at, to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons he gave, given birth to him, who has given birth to him. I'm just saying, at that day and age, to say a woman is worth seven sons, seven men was a big deal, okay? I just wanted to point that out because it says it in the text, and this whole book's about a woman. So anyway, let's keep going. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became her nurse, and the woman, women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This final note here for us that we see is legacy is faith invested. Legacy is faith invested. So Boaz may have been shrewd, right? Like he was real smart in his sales pitch to the guy, but he didn't hustle the guy, right? He wasn't trying to hustle him out of the, out of the deal to try to get what he wanted. He was very honorable. And in that honor, God honored him, right? Like God blessed Boaz by, he, he gave him his wife. He got his girl. He got the land. He wins the day, right? That's what verse 13 essentially says. And not only that, God put his seal on it by providing a son, he provided a son for them, and the people around them, they're praising, they're getting excited. They're like, man, finally something happened. What they got to see for a moment was a glimpse of redemption, right? Because these people were faithful. And so they wished well of them. They prayed for them. And, and the thing that I want to point out, though, is the legacy that Boaz is leaving for people. Boaz is in complete contrast to the unnamed man that we talked about earlier. The unnamed man, the unnamed redeemer was not willing to accept his responsibility and obey God, but Boaz was. The unnamed redeemer was motivated by self-interest and profit, but Boaz was motivated by love, even to the point of sacrifice. The unnamed redeemer was dishonorable, but Boaz was faithful. The unnamed man is a failed redeemer, but Boaz is a true one. Here's the thing. So commentators are pretty unanimous on this. The reason why that man's not named is because he doesn't have a legacy that'll last. It was intentional to not name him because, well, he didn't invest what he had, right? I remember the parable of the talents, the guy who hid it got rebuked because he didn't invest it. It's the same idea behind that, is that, man, he had the opportunity to invest in a godly, eternal, faith-filled legacy, and he said no. But Boaz did, and God doubled down on it, right? The story continues on where Ruth has this baby, which means Naomi, who was in pain and grief at the beginning of our story. Man, she has a grandson now, and not only does she have a grandson, but this woman gave birth to a baby in Bethlehem. And when that happened, there was blessing pronounced all over the place, right? Verse 14 and 15, then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer. This is crazy because at first she was kind of a spectacle when she came in. And now they're praising and blessing her and, and praising her and saying, man, God has blessed you so much. And so this can only mean one thing. The baby boy that Naomi now has as a grandson is also a redeemer. He's continuing the lineage, the legacy of being a redeemer. He's the gift from Ruth, right? See, Ruth 
if you weren't here with us, Ruth has stuck with her mother-in-law through thick and thin. They both lost their husbands. She could have gone home and left Naomi by herself, but instead she grieved with her. She was with her through all of the suffering. And then, not only that, this guy Boaz shows up, and he's also a gift giver in the sense that he, he helped redeem this family line so that it wasn't cut off. And so he's giving a son as well, taking Ruth as his wife. But here's the most important thing to take away from all that. Like, Ruth is great, Boaz is great. But here's the thing. This was a gift from God. It really was. Like, children in general are a gift from God, but this particular baby was a gift from God to this family. God's final word in action to Naomi in her bitterness and her emptiness that we saw in the beginning of the story is a baby born in Bethlehem. And I don't know about you, but when you hear of a baby born in Bethlehem, that should strike a chord for you, right? Because there's another baby, two babies actually, that it's really referring to that were born in Bethlehem. One being King David, the king of all kings of Israel, right? Like the greatest king of all, even though I'm like, man, this guy, I don't know how great he was. He had some really huge moral missteps. But nonetheless, he's seen as their greatest king. But the reason why David's important is because he points to an even greater king, and his name is Jesus. That's the baby born in Bethlehem. That's the great redeemer. When you look at all the redeemers in the story, the one that they're really pointing to is the man, Jesus Christ himself. Which is why the story goes on in verse 18 through 22. Real quick, I just want to read this, and I'll tell you why it's so important for us to see this. The last few verses. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Abinadab. Abinadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. But here's the thing. There's two names in that thing that kind of serve as a top and tail to this story for us. First name is Perez. Perez is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. But here's his story. It's kind of a crazy story. They start out from birth, right? So Perez is a twin, actually. His brother's in there, too. And his brother sticks his arm out first. So what happens is the midwives come out. They tie a ribbon around his, his wrist because they're like, oh, there's the firstborn. So he gets the inheritance. And then he pulls it back. And all of a sudden, Perez gets over his brother and comes out first. <laughs> like, dude, is an overcomer. I'm just saying, like, he's an achiever. Um, and, and for him to do that was a big deal in Israel, right? Like, for him to do that, it was saying something about him that he was a cut above everyone else. So if you look at Perez, Perez is consistently mentioned in Scripture because it means he's important. He's a cut above. If you are a part of his family line, they're saying, hey, you're right here. And then David, right? David was her great-great-grandson, Ruth's great-great-grandson, and he was, like I said, the greatest leader to ever lead the people of Israel. And so catch this. Perez and David are saying about these commoners that they're a part of a, a royal lineage. That's the legacy they get to be a part of. You see that? They're a part of Perez's family and David's family. They are commoners. And, and I say this, this. This is super important for us in the room because this is, this is where we land with Jesus primarily here, is the fact that you have these people, Moabite woman, so kind of not really thought of, a widow, and then Boaz. He's an honorable, moral guy, but he's, for the most part, nobody. He's not a king. He's not a priest. He, he doesn't have a title necessarily, but he's a part of this beautiful royal family. And so then you flip over the pages to Matthew 1, chapter 5, and you find out a little bit more about Boaz that you, that you didn't know already. Boaz's mom was Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute, okay? Rahab was a prostitute. And so as you start to contemplate all of that, this is the family line of Jesus that we're talking about in Matthew 1, who is more royal and more privileged than Perez or David will ever be. And yet in his family line, he's got prostitutes, murderers, adulterers, just good moral guys. <laughs> and, it, and he's got Moabite women, foreigners in his family line. So here's the catch for you. You don't have to be someone, a part of a royal family outside of Christ to leave a legacy of faith. It doesn't matter what your mom and dad did. It doesn't matter what your family history is. It doesn't matter even what your DNA is. You can be a part of a great family legacy by bowing your knee and following the Jesus Christ who says, give up everything because I've given you everything in myself. That's what this story is leading us to, is normal people leaving a faith legacy by faithfully obeying faithfully sacrificing, and faithfully leaving something behind for others. Amen? Let's pray.